So we've been heavily involved with the fishermen for many years trying to find solutions for them. Um, but I'm going to talk today about a little project that uh, I backed into uh, that is related to commercial and recreational fishery. Uh, without, um, it was actually uh, Cat's father that I'm going to explain. Um, but it's been a very interesting project, and I'm going to put it in the context of global fisheries activities. Because I think that um, I'm going to talk specifically about this application we developed for recreational fisheries. But I want to put it in the context of global fishery production and sort of the mismanagement of fisheries that probably most of you are somewhat familiar with. So um, first, I'm going to put this in the context of commercial fisheries so that everybody has an understanding of it. Recreational fishing is by de definition not for profit. And a lot of recreational fishing is actually catch and release. Uh, people do it for sport and not for food. Commercial fishing, on the other hand, is an economic enterprise where fish are caught and sold in the marketplace. And commercial fishing, fishing is usually managed by uh, a variety of relevant government entities, state or federal or international agreements. Uh, by and large, saltwater recreational fishing is not managed or managed very lightly. Uh, only recently are we starting to see the move by NOAA fisheries to uh, license saltwater recreational fishermen. And uh, the, most of the restrictions on recreational fishermen and saltwater is, are related to species specific restrictions or sometimes size limitations as we strike the best. But before we go into the recreational stuff, I'm, we're going to take a little tour of world fisheries. And these are always uh, kind of grim uh, discussion points but you need to know about it. Um, the story of the worldwide excesses of commercial fishing are well known and it's illustrated in this graph. Um, let me see if I can find the graph. There it is. So wild fisheries, if you look at this, let's see if we can get this to work. So wild fisheries increased really from the 50s right up into the early 1990s. And then the thing you'll notice here is that it starts to pale, it starts to uh, actually level out or actually decline. Uh, in all of the world, excluding China. And you'll notice that the Chinese fishery actually increased during this time as this section here got wider and wider. Now, this um, change in the commercial fisheries occurred in spite of huge advances in technology. So for example, fish, finding, fish finders got very sophisticated. Humans got really good at finding fish in remote corners of the world. And a couple other things happened. There's a big growth in open ocean fleets going fishing way offshore and far away from home. And there were also the emergence of fleets from nations that had never had uh, high seas fisheries, for example, Taiwan and the Philippines. Um, so all of these things happened at the same time. And yet, even with all that increase in technology and fishing fleets, we see the fish catches declining slightly or uh, staying the same. From a biological uh, perspective. This means that we're catching the same or fewer fish with a lot more boats and technology. And the end game for that scenario is pretty familiar. Too many fishermen, fish stocks are declining faster than the big fish can make more little fish. And there will be collapses of fish stocks without some corrections. So the funny thing is that if you go to the supermarket and you buy fish, uh, you'll find that it's actually still pretty cheap. And the laws of supply and demand suggest that low-cost fish means there's still plenty of it. So how can that be so if the wild fish is declining? And the answer to that is in aquaculture. And this is the trend lines in aquaculture production worldwide. And you can see in a mere um, 30 years, we've gone from you know 10 million tons to well on our way to 60 million tons of uh, aquaculture. Production. It now provides over one third of all the world's uh, seafood. And this trend in the growth of aquaculture is actually expected to continue into the foreseeable future. So let's look at a couple of examples of the mismanagement of commercial fisheries. Some wild fish species have fared much worse than others. So any of you who have read the book Cod or are familiar with the cod fishery you realize that. They were the backbone of the early European colonization efforts for the Canadian Maritimes and for New England. Um, cod was king, and it was the basis of huge market uh, between Europe and the New World. But if you look at the 
miserable uh, experience of Todd in the last four years, you see that basically there's been nearly a complete collapse of cod stocks in the United States and Canada, mostly due to contemporary fishing efforts and the failure to manage stocks appropriately. One of the pieces of this that I want to point out is the blue line represents actual landings in the Western North Atlantic. The red line represents what we thought were research surveys that were supposed to predict how big a stock, cod stock there would be in subsequent years. And you can see that they don't track very well, which suggests that our ability to monitor cod production uh, failed. So some ocean basins fared worse than others. More remote places actually did better. Uh, but places like the North Atlantic, where people have been fishing for hundreds of years, got hammered pretty hard. So this is the western North Atlantic, this is our backyard, and declines across most fish species are apparent in that light blue at the bottom of the graph. But if you're a really sharp eye, you will notice that this little wedge here, this kind of medium blue color, is actually increasing from year to year. And here's, here's uh, this is lobsters and crabs, and the cool thing about that increase is that that's because we killed all the cod and cod love eat lobster and crab larvae. So when you reduce the cod, you automatically increase the, the bugs. And um, that those landings have increased now, for example, in the state of Maine, it's 100 million pounds of lobster a year, or thereabouts. Record catches with no sign of any kind of collapse. And so it's good for, um, good for lobster, it's not so good for cod. And this is partly the result of a history of managing each fishery as if it were isolated from the ecosystem. In other words, if you go out and you just manage one fish stock, and you don't care about what the consequences are of depleting it, all kinds of things can happen to your ecosystem. And that's exactly what's happened in the Gulf of Maine. We're looking at a big ecosystem shift in the Gulf of Maine and in Canadian waters. And we have no idea where that is going or where it's going to end. So there's another way to look at the, the history of fisheries depletion. Uh, catches tell one story, none of it very pretty, but the other thing that you can look at is the size of the animals that are being taken. So um, this is a photograph that actually my father took in 1954 in Naples, Italy. And it's a fish monger on the street, and they weren't really big in the refrigeration. But, and uh, one thing you'll notice about this is that all of the fish are actually about the same size as fish you would find in the supermarket today. Uh, in the United States. So uh, this is actually the same, or right next to the air, same area in Naples. I took this big picture in 19, uh, 2008. And um, one thing you'll notice about this, these are uh, obviously not fish, these are uh, clams and scallops and some other shellfish species. But one thing to notice here is that all of these animals are smaller than anything you would find in the shellfish counter in any of your local grocery stores. And um, that's because in the Mediterranean, there are no large animals left to catch. As overfishing occurs, smaller and smaller animals become acceptable to the market and to fishermen. And in successive generations of consumers and fishermen, everyone accepts the new small size as normal. So for the guys fishing in uh, the Med and the consumers on the streets in Naples, this seemed perfectly normal. These uh, small shellfish in the middle are literally the size of my thumbnail. I mean, can you imagine making a dinner out of that? So that's one other way to think about uh, how <coughs> fisheries have changed over the last 50 years. I couldn't actually get a picture of the uh, fish market on this day because they had a live octopus in there and they were trying to escape and the whole fish market was in an uproar. <laughs> and they didn't get away. It's too bad, we were rooting for the octopus. So I want to switch gears a little bit and um, talk about the fish that uh, Bill Copeland got me interested in um, bluefin tuna. Uh, this is an example, uh, another example of overexploitation. And <clears throat> bluefin tuna are these amazing predatory animals, perhaps among the most amazing in the marine world. They can swim nearly 50 miles an hour, and they grow to over a thousand pounds, and they can travel thousands of miles in a single year. They've been subject to a large commercial fishery for decades. And they're also the favorite target of some recreational fishermen, quite a few. And a couple of years ago, uh, Bill and a couple of his recreational fishing friends came to me and said that they were worried about the status of bluefin tuna 
because of a lot of stuff that was happening uh, internationally and things they'd been reading in the paper. Most of these guys were catch and release fishermen, so they're probably not responsible for you know, killing off the tuna, but they were worried that there would be closures of their fishery and there'd be other consequences if they didn't pay attention. So let's look at what they were worried about. So this is the, uh, this is our backdoor stock. This is the population of bluefin tuna that lives in the West and North Atlantic. And you can see that in the um, 60s, there were some big uh, spikes and catches in here. And then the Japanese longline fleet came into the Gulf of Mexico and off of Brazil and they, uh, north of Brazil, and they killed a lot of bluefin tuna in the uh, late 70s. And then after this, there were some strict quotas in both, and uh, the Western North Atlantic bluefin tuna fishery has largely been regulated pretty tightly since that time. But even given that regulation, I want you to pay special attention to this decline as this time frame goes on right up to 2010. So why might that be? So this is the other part of the tuna story. And it's, uh, <clears throat> we're looking at the European and Mediterranean catches, catches of bluefin tuna. Now, at the time, uh, really until quite recently, and even now there's still controversy about it, bluefin tuna in the North Atlantic were managed as if they were two completely isolated stocks of tuna, one in the, uh, one in our side of the ocean and one on the European side, and that there was no interbreeding between them. So the concept was that if you went and killed a bunch of tuna somewhere else, it wouldn't affect our population on our side of the ocean. But in fact, um, as you look at the fishing statistics, you can see that this, they, they increased uh, a bunch of fur seining in the Mediterranean in the mid-90s, and they had a peak around 1995, and then it dropped off a bit, and at this point, all of a sudden over the last four years, we've seen a dramatic collapse of lupin tuna in the European fishery. And you'll remember that's the same time that uh, we saw continued declines in the Western North Atlantic. Now, one of the interesting things is that uh, we've now got tag data from bluefin tuna tagged in the Western North Atlantic that show that they go over to the Mediterranean back with some regularity. So, in fact, we weren't managing the stock appropriately. The stock was being managed internationally by the International Commission on Atlantic Tuna, and they uh, assumed the two stock hypothesis, and they were they failed to catch the fact that the fish were one population and that they were being uh, killed off by the Europeans. So it was one of these classic cases where a highly migratory species crosses borders with different kind of management regimes and inconsistent management regimes. And if you're one of those migratory species, you're likely to take it on the chin. By the way, uh, just so uh, we don't feel uh, smug in our inability to manage anything. This is the southern bluefin tuna, and uh, the, the, the northern hemisphere has not really cornered the market on mismanagement. The bluefin tuna in the southern hemisphere show a very similar pattern of decline and depletion. So again, high catches in the 60s, and then a steady decline continuing right up to today. So this got me, this whole bluefin tail got me really interested in the recreational fishery its value and its impact on fish stocks. So I uh, wanted to just cover a little bit about the value of recreational fishery because it's substantially more than you realize. You can see from the numbers here in the upper right that there are millions of people fishing in salt water. Um, it's very widespread. The numbers of uh, the numbers, the financial numbers are quite impressive too. Recreational fishermen spend about $18 billion on equipment and four hire vessels in 2006. It's probably gone up since then. And the contributions, uh, as they're multiplied through the economy, go, uh, they estimate that recreational fishing alone accounts for $49 billion in the U.S. economy and creates about 400,000 jobs. So uh, that doesn't include multipliers for hotel rooms and other travel expenses. But how does this stack up against commercial fisheries? So let's think about the population of fish first. NOAA estimates that recreational fishermen caught about 173 million pounds of fish. But the commercial fisheries, this is in 2009, and the commercial fisheries took something like 7.9 billion pounds. So hmm, maybe we start thinking, well, really, recreational fisheries are not going to actually impact fishery collapses or stock management at all. Um, it 
shouldn't, it looks like recreational fisheries shouldn't manage matter to conservation level. But it turns out to be a little more complicated than that. The effects of recreational fishing are highly regional and species specific. So for example, recreational fishermen landed about 13 million pounds of red drum in 2009, while commercial counterparts only landed 200,000 pounds. So the same year in the South Atlantic, in the Gulf of Mexico, sport fishing, recreational fishermen, hauled in 60% of the total catch of red snapper which is a species classified as overfished and subject to overfishing by NOAA. So it depends on where you are and what you're fishing for, but in some cases, recreational fishing may actually have an impact. Um, there are uh, economic twists to this. The per fish value to the economy is probably much higher in recreational fishing than it is in commercial fishing. I think, um, so we're talking about 50 billion or thereabouts for recreational fishing in the US and they're, the commercial fisheries are in the order of about 115 billion, so about two and a half times, but the actual number of uh, fishermen involved is much greater in the recreational fishery. Anyways, mm -hmm. NOAA has a, a, a really good new program to try to assess recreational fisheries called Marine Recreational Information Program, and it takes advantage of uh, a lot of smart scientists and sophisticated models for assessing uh, catches and so on. And basically, they collect data in two ways. They wander around the docks, and they interview fishermen that come in, and they say, OK, how many fish did you catch, and how much did they weigh, and what were the species, and where did you catch them? And that way, they collect information on the average catch per trip. Then they, a separate group of people do these phone surveys, and they ask uh, fishermen how many trips they took over the last two months. And um, they figured that guys are not going to remember all the catches they had, so they just want to know how many days they went fishing. And then they take those two data sets, separate data sets, and they multiply the number of days people were fishing times the number of fish they caught per average trip. And from that, they calculate the total catches. Now, it's a really good start, and they have a lot of, uh, like I said, very sophisticated models for dealing with it. But there's, um, uh, there's a question. That, I mean, it seems quite reasonable, but one does wonder about some things. So can it be improved? The deal with fishermen is they're genetically programmed to lie or forget. And there's a good reason for that. I, I know it because I'm a fisherman. And I especially know it because he and Brian. Um, and it's not malicious or mean. It's self-preservation, and it's probably been programmed into us since the first time we threw a line in the water. So you have to think about this way. <coughs> caveman with a hook went out and he found a really good fishing spot, right? So he's out there fishing. And the guy from the neighboring tribe comes along and he says, uh, how's the fishing? That first guy's going to say, it is terrible. I haven't seen a fish in years. And hopefully the guy will go away. And the interesting thing about that notion, of course, is that all fishermen individually recognize that there's a limit to the number of fish in that fishing hole. And they actually are trying to control it by keeping access to it on their own. And the tragedy of oceanic fishing is that nobody actually owns it. And so everyone can go fish everywhere. Um, but also that individual fishermen recognize that they can't control it, and therefore they have to fish as fast as possible, and as much as possible, to beat out the other guy. So um, it is something that we've forgotten that we need to protect our fishing holes. So managers have problems with liars like me and Randy. Uh, and and um, what can we do about it? So as a way of moving the data collection on recreational fishing forward, and as I said, I'm not sure this is a uh, critical conservation area for all species, but for some species it may be. Uh, we decided to develop an app to collect information on recreational fisheries from the fishermen themselves directly while they were on their fishing trip. And such data collection would allow us to analyze how much time fishermen spend on the water trying to catch fish, how many fish they caught, and where they caught them. Now you gotta wonder why anybody would want to volunteer that information to guys like us. Um, so it's partly because we did some really cool things with this. First of all, we offered, uh, this app offers sea surface temperature data in real time. It's actually a composite image collected over the previous seven days. 
And before you go to sea, you can click on this thing, and it helps fishermen plan because a lot of fishermen like to fish along frontal boundaries where fish aggregate. So uh, places where uh, different water masses of different temperatures meet are usually pretty good fishing places. So for example, this is for the last seven days uh, south of uh, here. You'll notice that there's a little, the satellite imagery works, but the Google Maps part of the app is not working right, so that you are now living in Manchester, New Hampshire, as far as I can tell. Um, but one of the things about this is that uh, if you were to go fishing out here, you would be very interested in the boundary waters around this little eddy here, and possibly along the leading edge of this. The other place that would be really good is at the southern end of the Great South Channel. These cold water boundaries, warmer water incursions. This represents an upwelling of cold water coming in from the north. So these are places where fishermen like to go. So that's one good thing. Um, the second good thing uh, is that it, prevents, it, it provides a uh, password and a protected log of your entire fishing trip and all the fishing trips you ever record. So the iPhone is GPS enabled, so it records everything while you're out fishing. And then it synchronizes with the server back on land when you come back near a uh, cell phone tower. Um, <clears throat> and all of the data is loaded into the logs that are <coughs> protected just for you. So your Uncle Joe can't go check on your log to see where you were fishing the other day and caught all those fish. So it's actually uh, protected. Um, and this is a test track I made in the Bay of Fundy last summer uh, where we bombed out <coughs> Blew back out past here, and we did some surveys. And uh, the red dots represent places that we either took samples or had particular events that we wanted to record. Now, if you're a fisherman, these things would be represented by a fish you caught, or maybe at lunch, or maybe somebody did something really stupid and you had to get a picture of it. But they they would uh, you know what fishing trips are like. So um, that would be the that would be the way the data would show up on the map. And um, the other cool thing is that each event you get to take a picture of things and you get to record any information you want about it. In this particular case, I uh, ran into a bunch of right whales and I took some pictures and it provides me both with the position, the date, and the time, and a little note on what we saw and a photograph so that uh, oops, the image uh, yeah, the image of the animals is shown here. It's not uh, very high quality, but it's good enough for the information that you might want to record. So this is the kind of thing that you do. And in exchange, uh, we agree not to provide individually identifiable data to the general public. No one can see who went fishing where. And we plan to analyze cumulatively all the effort data plus the catch data to figure out both spatially and temporally where the highest catch per unit of effort is and what species are being caught in what areas. And theoretically, this would be the first time you could actually count on, not have to rely on memory uh, of fishermen, and it would be a way in which you could collect data on the fishery that would be reliable. Um, the, good thing, the other good thing about being able to take a picture is that when your friends accuse you of lying because you caught that big a fish, you could actually show them a picture of that big fish, even if you released it. So, like all good fishing stories, um, there's drama, excitement, conflict, fish get caught, lives get told, and then there's a somewhat uncertain resolution. The history of fishing is fraught with tales of mismanagement and overfishing. And uh, there are, however, a lot of reasons to hope that things are improving. We've learned a lot from the mistakes of the past. Uh, scientists and managers are now trying to implement management regimes that take into account the full ecosystem uh, issues around fishing so that we can say, okay, well, if you kill all the cod, then you'll have many more lobsters, but you might not have such and such. I mean, in other words, we're trying to figure out how, what the interactions are. And um, there's another, uh, there's a lot of hope based on actually terrestrial management of freshwater systems because largely there's, a, there's a fairly successful management of freshwater fisheries, uh, lakes and streams. And, these are on a smaller scale, but it does demonstrate that it's possible to do that. Recreational fisheries, I think the take home message for me was recreational fisheries are probably not responsible for most of the problems of overfishing around the world, but in selected fisheries and in selected areas, this kind of information would be pretty valuable. 
And uh, NOAA Fisheries is moving to work with the states on regional management plans for recreational fisheries, and it's definitely a step in the right direction. And we hope that this app that we've developed will actually lead to uh, better information that managers can use to improve fishery management in all areas. And what we'd like to see is fish like those on the left or on the right uh, return in large numbers. Thank you. for those boats? It varies from state to state so far. The NOAA is trying to tread very carefully into this because they're really distrusted by recreational federal and they don't. Uh, they haven't. Uh, if you've ever done a recreational fishing survey for NOAA, it used to be a paper. It used to be four pages of paper with all kinds of little things to fill out. And then nobody would do it. So I think charter boat captains are going to be included under some special category, but I don't think they've tried it out very do the children have to personally sign up for the app in order to get all the features and then they can help you know the data? Yeah, you buy the app and then you register. And by registering, you're sort of agreeing to let us uh, look at the data. And then it gives you all it gives you access to the server, gives you a password, and uh, gives you all the access of the, uh, you know, the satellite imagery and so on. I spend a lot of time offshore, and uh, when we keep track of everything, like written anyway, like to um, want to know exactly where the fish are caught, so that we can get back there. And also, yeah. you know, we've had them come out yep. a lot. So with this uh, app, do you have to actually keep the phone on all the time? Because electricity is not always like, you know. So. Yeah, it's actually a little bit uh, power hungry because of the GPS. So right. you need to plug it into a cigarette lighter or get one of those uh, supplementary batteries. It, and that's one drawback, but it does uh, record in real time so that as you're looking at the phone, you can actually track back to your, where your fish were in real time. Or you can just, uh, you know, wait until you get home and post it to your friends because it'll all be online. So you can get the store. We're working on a tablet version of this because tablets are easier to see and see in uh, bright daylight. Yeah. So how many do you have out there now in the field? How far along are you on? Uh, well, as you saw, we had a few little glitches with the Google Maps synchrony with right. the maps. So I think they're actually revising it. But we do not, We have about uh, only a dozen beta tests out. But we're hoping to trot this thing out in uh, uh, sometime late, late winter, early spring. And I'm assuming there'll be an Android version. Uh, not at the moment. You got to weigh those two populations. <laughs> We we actually did an informal poll of the tuna fishermen, and they're all at, they're all at Apple guys. Well, that says something right there. Anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they have more money than we do. Hey, Scott, uh, on, on your data for your land uh, recreational catches, those landed fish or caught fish, would you want to talk a little bit about survivability of catch and release fishing? So there is no data on the release fish. Uh, landings are the only thing that NOAA reports, and you put your finger on one of the reasons this app might prove useful, because um, there is a big question about uh, survivability of animals that are caught and release. We know a lot about things like bonefish, uh, which are not really a, a boat-based fishery, uh, because people have been studying them a lot. We know very little about things like marlin and sailfish, which are, you know, problematic pelagic animals that you probably never seen. So the, there is a need for additional, probably physiological work on the catch and release uh, methodology that are used by fishermen. There are recommendations for most, uh, most catch and release fish that have to do with uh, gentle handling and uh, appropriate boarding. But we don't know for a lot of these fish what the survivability is. We know for bluefin tuna because there's been a lot of work on that. And we know for uh, 
some of the sharks, but not mostly the big predator ones, predatory ones, not the small ones. Uh, it's, a pro it's a problem area, and uh, NOAA is not, uh, doesn't address it in the recreation state. Um, yeah, how have fishermen lately been dealing with bycatch? Oh, you mean the commercial fishermen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know about recreational bycatch really at all. I mean, you can catch stuff, but you usually let it go. Uh, there's, I, and again, it's the problem. It's the problem of knowing what survives. On the commercial side, the best thing you can say about bycatch, there's a lot of research going on to reduce the bycatch of non-targeted species. So. Uh, fishermen have got, uh, so shrimp fishermen try their darndest to get rid of jellyfish and turtles, and they have lots of technology to do that. Um, some gill netters have gone to larger bench sizes so they don't catch juvenile fish. Uh, there are a variety of uh, options in midwater trawlers and deep water draggers that can be used to try to keep uh, animals from jumping into the nets that they don't want. So by and large, bycatch is that uh, elephant in the room that uh, has not been solved for very many fisheries. The best fishery that remains as it originally started is probably hook and line. And uh, very little commercial fisheries are hook and line. So bycatch will remain a problem for decades to come. 